Good morning, everybody. My guest today is Steve Salis. And now Steve was recently appointed as the coaching ambassador for the youth section of the Metropolitan Police Football Club. And he really does bring a true fusion of experience to the role. After eight years at Brighton and Hove Albion, he embarked on a 17 year career in education, earning nominations as National Teacher of the Year, taking on senior positions at a range of inner London secondary schools, advising Her Majesty's Government on school behaviour strategies and bringing notable improvements to schools in special measures. He has lectured at the University of East London. He's completed postgraduate research in leadership and educational psychology, and he's currently waiting to complete his doctorate in sports psychology. <laughs> Steve now provides focused coaching across both business and sporting environments in leadership and in behavioral and technical performance support, where he now works with some 20 Premier League and Football League players. Steve, first of all, many thanks for making the time to participate in this Zoom interview. Bernard, thank you for having me. I've been a little bit embarrassed about that, that write-up, Bernard, to be honest. I've, you know, as I've told you, we better start this. I'm obviously on a big, big podcast this afternoon, and you mentioned on a text message, didn't you, that like that's more important. And I said, no, Bernard, you don't, you don't um, forget where you've come from, mate. So it's, uh, yeah, big, big importance about my journey, and I'm sure I'll share that shortly. You're very kind. Thank you so much once again. Okay, um, so basically, Steve, the first question has to be, new role with the Metropolitan Police Youth Section. I mean, how do you actually envisage the role of a coaching ambassador at a point when maybe grassroots sport, well, really, is it a true crossroads? Yeah, I think, I think the first thing is it says a lot about the leadership of Met Police Football Club in general. that they, I call it in my book, Zooming In and Zooming Out. They were able to see an opportunity where they felt I could add value and support the football club. Now, I think, I think you know, we've been very clear on it. I won't be having a, you know, an active operational role. It will be very sort of advisory and strategic. And, I, and it's, it's just a no-brainer, really. Obviously, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to grow a business and, and create a, a bigger network. And they might need someone that can support their parents and players and, and, and coach and staff on, on trying to get the best possible experiences for their kids. Right. <laughs> You mentioned the whole question of support, and I think this is probably a unique time where actually everyone's looking to support themselves. I mean, we've got people with uncertainty in their health situation, uncertainty in their work situation, possibly also uncertainty in their psychological situation. I mean, maybe this is a point at which really, you know, Everyone needs to take a step back and possibly look at, you know, just just how we how we're approaching life and how we're managing ourselves. Yeah, I think like I mean, if you're linking this to Corona at the moment, I don't, I don't think anyone's winning right now, Bernard. I don't think that's the biggest challenge. And again, going back to the first question, I think what Met Police have done very uniquely is is still quite try to create an educational sort of stimulus in in this period. And then, you know, that stimulus being me supporting, um, me supporting the, the parents and coaches that are obviously volunteers in, in that. And I think, again, the second part of the question really is about the process of corona. I, I think it's been a challenge for everyone. Everyone keeps calling it this word unprecedented. I mean, it, it is, but, but we have to make the most of it. I mean, the one thing I am a little bit frustrated of now, there's, there's certain kids in the country right now that, that are, are undernourished and haven't got safe homes. So I'm not talking about those types of kids that need support in schools. But at the moment, this is an opportunity to, to get your kids to become resilient and, and become stoic. Like, and everyone just seems to be like worrying about this. Like, we've just got to get on with it, Bernard. Like, you know, I keep going back to it. Like, my granddad was in the war, jumping out of aeroplanes. Like, what actually have we got to worry about? My stepmom, she works in, um, in Royal Sussex County Hospital. So like every day. So like, that's affecting the family beyond that. So... Really, I think this, this opportunity at the moment is we got to see, you know, not the threats, we've got to see the opportunities. And I'm not being patronising to people that are having it tough, but I don't know anyone that's winning, Bernard. That's my point. So we've all got to try and adapt. And this, this adaptation to our lives is, I think, I think in the long term only going to help us. Right. So in, obviously you mentioned once again uh, the whole connection with the Metropolitan Police youth team. I mean, at a time like this, what sort of additional, if you like, role to provide resilience do you think a, a, a grassroots sport club like the Met could, uh, can actually provide? 
Yeah, well, I think from a kid's point of view, I think we break it down in, into the kids and the, and the parents and the coaching staff. I think that's that's the first thing. Um, in terms of the kids' resilience, I mean, it's every every child every child matters. So I think I don't think we can do a whole scale approach to what resilience is. I think parents just need to be mindful that that um, they don't get sucked into their friends' kids and their friends' kids. They just understand their own children's needs because everyone's children's needs are going to be entirely different. Every child goes to a different school. We've got schools have got different strategies. Some schools are here and doing really good jobs at the moment regarding homework and stimulus, and some schools are not doing so good jobs. So I think it all comes on a, on a personal level. I think with, with regards to resilience for parents, I think, you know, sometimes we forget about the parents, don't we? It's always all about the kids, but there's a lot of parents out there struggling right now, um, trying to survive. We're going to have loads of potential, I've read in the newspaper, potential repossessions with houses. So that's like really terrible news. So I think, again, as always, Bernard, I always say, like, be mindful of other people's lens on the world. And I don't see the world how you see the world, and you don't see the world how other people see the world. So, yeah, resilience comes in different forms, doesn't it? Um, and, then, and then for the coaching staff, my advice is, is just to keep communicating to your players and don't, and don't let it drift. You know, don't let that gap drift. Even if it's just a quiz or an informal seminar or something just relaxed on Zoom. Or I know, I know now we're a little bit more relaxed about doing social distancing training. So my advice again to all, all coaching staff is don't get sucked into what the kids want because I know they're gonna they're gonna want games, aren't they? Um, and we and we just gotta make sure we're careful of of you know of the rules and regs. I mean coming back, you mentioned um, resilience and resilience across three different groups of people. I mean obviously specifically for example maybe at the the junior level of football club, um, so for example the youth section at the Met here. I mean how how does one actually whether it's the coaches whether it's the parents how does one actually encourage and develop and inspire resilience in maybe you know a younger child for example especially at a time like this yeah resilience is an interesting topic i'm i'm reading about it all the time bernard i'm always trying to upskill myself on resilience and in my corporate training for my business, I always ask people, adults as well, to define the word resilience. Because I think people's perception of the word is quite interesting. Now, if you get, I know Google's not exactly the gospel, is it? But if you actually Google resilience, right, it says the ability to bounce back from, from something tough, right? And the key word is quickly. Right. A lot of people interpret resilience as your ability to absorb crap. You know, just got to keep absorbing stuff. Yeah, just absorbing stuff. But no, that's that's not resilience. Resilience is getting getting hit and then getting back up quick. And I, and that's what I want people to understand about resilience. It's not this ability to just to keep absorbing stuff. We're all humans, Bernard. Everyone has sh struggles mentally, physically, etc. So we need to you know maybe redefine resilience. Understand that getting beat. Okay, let's bounce back. Um, you know, and, and, and linking to resilience for kids. I, you know, Ant Middleton said on a podcast recently that. You know, I know he's an SAS man and not everyone in, is, is an SAS man. But he did say something quite relevant about, and I say, I've said it a lot in social media about making kids' lives easy. And, and I think we do make kids' lives too easy. Like, you know, a kid, I'll give, let me give you a prime example. A kid comes into your kitchen and says, Dad, Dad, I've got, I've got a problem. And, and then the parent like, tries to solve the problem because it's what parents do. Mm. Wouldn't it be brilliant if the parent just went, well, what do you think the solution is? And the kid goes, I don't know, because that's what kids are going to do. Okay, well, come back to me in 24 hours and then talk to me about it when you've got a solution. Right? That, that's what we did in schools for 20 years. Like, we're just trying to create a process of, of thinking strategies for kids where when mummy and daddy are gone, like, the kid has to live in the real world world and go and survive. So I'm not saying don't be loving. I'm not saying that. But we're not helping ourselves as parents because we're not giving the kids strategies to be able to solve problems. Right. And I presume you're applying that then really across every level of maybe a, a child's activities, whether that's what they're doing, their relationship with their parents, their relationship with their teachers. And if they're a sporting child, their relationship to their teammates and to the coaches with which they interact. Yeah. And I'll give you an applied example here, how we build resilience in a coaching session, because this is partly a football football cast as well yeah in a coaching session you would have like conditioned games Bernard so you would have like a, maybe an 8v6 where the six gets stressed out a little bit and they're overloaded by two players you might deliberately want to start um, this is a classic in pro football Bernard you deliberately give free kicks that are not free kicks 
right? So, yeah, so the players just get annoyed. And then, obviously, on a match day, that's what happens as well. So, trying to, trying to get the kids uh, and the adults, you know, pro football players, in the head zone that the, the decision has been made, can I get back into my position and shut my mouth and get on with it? Um, instead of talking to the referee. So, there's loads of little tricks of the trade on a coaching level to build resilience. Um, and, and also, you know, in a school setting, for example... If, if my team ever went 4-0 ahead, and sometimes we went 4-0 behind, but if I ever went 4-0 ahead, I'll just take a player off, you know, or swap positions or make them play two-touch. Like, I'm not interested, Bernard, in winning 15-0. And if there's ever a message to the Met Police staff today is that don't get satisfaction as a coach by winning 15-0. That's a waste of time. And that's, not help, that's not helping anyone. So, you know, in my book, I call it Prove Yourself or Improve Yourself. And there's too much obsession with proving ourselves when actually we just need to get better. Because by beating someone 15 nil, we always know, Bernard, that the level, the next level, you're not going to beat someone 15 nil. You're going to probably going to lose, but then you haven't got the toolbox as a player to be able to get to the next level because you've been focused on winning too much. So, you know, developments is a key, 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 key parameter to success. Right. And looking at the, the whole question of player development, now... During your time spent teaching, you undertook a lot of um, diagnostic and a lot of remedial work with underperforming schools. Um, if you are now to, to take a step back and to look at how football coaching currently is being undertaken at non-league, at junior, at youth levels, and maybe in school settings as well, um, are there certain things that coaches, in your opinion, could repeatedly be doing better so you know a repeating thread and at the same time perhaps um are there maybe areas where given the structure given the resources maybe we really need to give ourselves a small pat on the back coaching's definitely improving we'll start with the second part of the question right i mean obviously john nurse who i've spoken to on the phone recently is an absolute legend of a guy in the club i'm massively lucky to have a, a guy of his experience and, and you know intelligence on board and we were talking about the non-league game. The non-league game is improving at a massive rate. Now, it's improving at a massive rate because the pitches have improved over the last 25 years um, in terms of something even technical details. Grass seeds improved. It means the pitches improved. Right. The, four Gs have made, the four Gs have made the game more, more technical. The coaches now in non-league are better and more qualified than they've ever been. So that means that we've got more, yeah, more educated people in the game that have more knowledge to be able to impart it's quite common sense really that that answer and I think again remember the Met Police pitch is normally like a bowling green but most pitches haven't always been like that over the years in non-league they've been you know it's but they've been heavy which means the technical players Bernard often get bullied out of the game so you know that over the years if you go over the history of non-league you know because the pitches are so bad that's why teams have to play long ball and if you're going to play long ball style then you need bigger players traditionally you know you need more physical players so I think that, that, element's, that element's really important. And I think, really, in terms of, you were saying, improving um, people or improving coaches, what can they do? I mean, let's just take this out of coaching and just put this to anybody. Again, in my book, I'll talk about the number one thing that everybody needs in life is, is self-awareness and in order to reflect accurately. Now, what, why would people need to reflect accurately if they're a Sunday league football coach? Well, they need to reflect because their practices, their behaviours, their language could be completely wrong, but they don't know it's wrong. Mm. And we're still seeing that. Now, let me apply this for you. I call it, when I was a university lecturer, we used to call it the bus queue. Everyone goes, what's a bus queue? Well, what happens at a bus queue, Bernard? People stand in the line and they, they wait for a bus. Yeah. And I'm still seeing coaching sessions like that. I'm still seeing a kid with a ball waiting to have a shot at a goal and ready for this, Bernard, to wait three minutes to then have one shot to then miss the shot and then go and wait three minutes to have another shot. Yeah? That isn't coaching. Right. You know, that is the oldest, worst part. You know, that's the number one thing I teach on a teacher training degree. Whatever lessons you teach, when I come and see you teach as a trainee teacher, the number one thing I don't want to see is a bus queue. So if anyone's listening now, I mean, this would be a little good, great little transcript to feed out, really, because there's still coaches out there where kids are just waiting for a go. Like, that's not coaching. And then people say to me, Bernard, oh, what, well, what can I do then? I say, well, I don't care. That's not my job. That's your job to think about a, a session design, yeah, a, a lesson design where there is no bus queues. So the key thing really is 
no dead time in training. Total act activity, total participation, movement, concentration, and just thinking about the environment. And that's when there's a difference between teaching and coaching, Bernard, because I always ask that question on seminars that I run. I always say, is there a difference between teaching and coaching? I always challenge that concept because I genuinely think there is. Right. I mean, coming back to the, the, uh, the whole environment within which uh, non-league coaches have to work, um, there's probably very little else more frustrating than the limited amount of time that a non-league coaching team can spend with its playing squad. I mean, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how coaches perhaps should be putting this time to the best use possible? I mean, you've touched on it already in terms of making every minute count. But the problem you've got, I suppose, certainly at non-league at grassroots level, is not only have you got limited time with the players, but at the same time also you've got limited influence to their behaviours away from the training sessions. The vast majority of them have other jobs that might have physical exertion, shift work, danger, whatever. So in, I think increasingly that's probably going to be a challenge for non-league coaches that you, your players are actually dependent on other sources of income and you know, you've know you only got a limited amount of time how you can manage them when they're with you. Yeah, well, I'm going to break that, quick, that answer down into two sections, Bernard, because you talked about, you mentioned grassroots. So let me just tell a story about Millwall. The only team at Millwall that matters with winning, the only team is the first team. The 18s, 23s, 16s, all the way down to down the 9s, we do not give two hoots about the results. We care about improving the player. That is it. So let's break that down. In non-league, the key performance indicators and objectives for a club is to win games of football, right? Yep. So I think we need to separate the grassroots and the non-league because they are entirely different. Youth football, and it's really important that the Met Police parents listen to this, they need to ensure that the number one key performance indicator for their players every week and throughout a season is do they get better. Results are not a parameter of players getting better. And I'll tell you why. You can bang it long. You can go long. Kids can't handle long ball normally. And then you get a big kid up front who's quite quick. You win 5 nil. you look successful. You're not successful. Like, that's not how we produce world-class players. And if you only look at Lisa's son that's gone from Met Police first team to Charlton Athletic, mm. that says a lot. People, you know, the parents at the Met Police need to understand that if you're playing in Met Police's first team at 17 or 18, you are a top, top player. You are probably better than a 23s uh, uh, professional football club. Right, that is, that is how much I rate that level of football for a 17, 18-year-old. Right. So uh, the parents, again, they might know it, but they need to know that if you're playing in Met Police's first team at that age, you've got a chance of becoming a professional footballer, right? Because we know that the game's becoming more, more synchronised. Now, the second part of your question was, was around uh, non-league times. Uh, I have a big, big, knowledge, big knowledge of non-league, Bernard, as you know, and I, and I think the most important thing that, that people understand on this, this sentence is that you can't really improve a player technically in non-league football. Right, because you haven't got the time. Mm. So a lot of your work is tactical. So it's how we're going to be the opposition on Saturday. Now, traditionally, non-league clubs train Tuesday, Thursday. Not always, but normally Tuesday is a fitness session. Traditionally, but not always, but traditionally. And Thursday is more of a tactical session. So, yeah, the time limits. Now, the key to a successful manager in non-league now is getting the games filmed Right, that is probably the key component now to improving players is getting the games filmed. Because if you don't get the games filmed, you haven't got a frame of reference to refer to educating footballers. Because right. they don't, they've got, you know, players have got to be able to see it, Bernard. Players have got to be able to visualise themselves performing. So, yeah, that's been the game changer in non league, if I'm honest, is, is the games being filmed. And that's why non league's improved because there's so much more uh, social media input out there where. As an example, this will be the final point on this question. You can observe the opposition much better now because there's clips on the internet. Whereas in non-league, you know, you haven't got the budget to go and have a scout, so you're always guessing every week. But now, that's what managers are doing, Bernard. It's improved so much. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. The number of times Club X has been in touch with me after they played yeah. against the Met or something and say, yeah. oh, we've got so-and-so in two weeks. Yeah, then you say, well, actual fact, three quarters of it is actually gone. But I can give you, I can give you, I can give you four goals and a and a, and a safe penalty. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you're right. It's an insight, and it shows how they 
they, they, they build from the back or how with their formation. Set pieces mainly. Yeah, set pieces mainly. Set yeah. pieces is a big one. You know, what have they got up their sleeve? You know, and, and remember, every manager is different. Some managers like, you know, drive me mad, to be fair, Bernard. They go overkill in the opposition. You know, talk about the left winger for Tuesday, Thursday for five hours, and then the left winger's not even planned on the Saturday. So, you know, I'm a big believer in, you know, me and Jimmy, when we were at Leverhead, we always were focused on ourselves. You know, we did we did 5% on the opposition. Because right. at that level, the players aren't good enough to worry about the opposition, Bernard. They've just got to worry about themselves, mate. Fair enough. Um, just one, picking up one point you mentioned about your term of reference for a well-run youth football team being that the players are getting better. Um, maybe in the current era where kids have got a lot of distractions and things like that, um, maybe the other thing it's probably important also is that the kids are actually enjoying it. Yeah, I mean, listen, enjoyment's number one, isn't it? Can't, we can't, I said this in my book, like, I, I talk it in my book about talent and commitment. So that'd be easier, easier to example to use. If you've got a kid that's really high in talent and really high in commitment, they're likely to have half a decent career. So it, in, in education, we call something called differentiation. So you've got to differentiate the learning journey for each and an individual kid. You've got to differentiate every training session for every individual kid. I mean, that's, that's what great teaching does. It's very, very challenging. Um, so I think that enjoyment's number one, you know, number one thing for any kids. And the, but the main thing for the coaches is if you've got a kid that's low in talent and they're not likely to play at a high level, what you don't want to do is put them off the sport for life. Absolutely. Because as, as a parent, you're driving, driving them mad about results and, and performances, but they're not at the level. They haven't got the talent. And then as a coach, one day a week, you haven't got the time to technically make them better. Mm. So, like, they're not going to get better. Start going to school, Bernard. If you learn maths for one hour a week, you're not going to be very good, are you? So that's why, that's why kids do it for seven hours, seven hours a week. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, you know, the learning journey in football, education, English, maths doesn't change. You've just got to do hours to become better at it. So I think, again, yeah, my advice to coaches is just try and do a talent and commitment scale for your players. Be, you know, good for them to do. Hey, Steve, so do you actually believe that by sheer repetition and sheer exercise, uh, and by the volume of, of that level of exercise and repetition, you can actually perhaps still make a not particularly talented player better? All right, here's a, here's a question for you. Did you have a bad teacher when you were at school? Yes. Right, did you have a good teacher when you were at school? Yes. So what was the difference between the bad teacher and the good teacher? Um, I think the, the good teachers wanted you to get involved. You know, you saw you felt part of it. The, the bad teachers, you, you never used to look forward to the lessons. You know, you weren't, you know, um, and maybe you felt you weren't getting anything out of them. Yeah, and I think again, if you're doing ten, set, ten if you're doing ten thousand hours of, of practice, which is what they say to be an expert. So for those listeners that don't understand, there's a theory called the ten thousand hours theory. Well, if you do ten thousand hours of practice, you become an expert. Right. Whether that's tennis, chess, art, languages, whatever. Right. But remember, if you did ten thousand hours of something badly, yeah, you're not going to be successful. Linking to teaching, you right. still need hours but you need the detail of the coach and the teacher and if you haven't got the detail it doesn't matter how many i'll give you an example i teach you tennis bernard and you do it for ten thousand hours but i teach you the forehand top spin wrongly but because you've been doing it for so many hours you think you're all right but you're not all right you're doing it wrongly so right. you need that detail so the key thing is that that the actual teacher is competent in themselves, really. Yeah, unbelievable. On, on the podcast I'm on this afternoon, which you know about, yeah. they're going to talk to me about mindset, high performance, right? And I'm not like Ant Middleton's, like, who's a man Middleton? No one can just climb up Everest and be all right. All of most normal people, Bernard, they have to have subject knowledge to be able to be successful. An accountant, an architect, a builder, they have to have technical detail, don't they? And so when I'm going to go on there this afternoon, I'm just going to say, look, it's knowledge. It's, it's, not, it's not effort. You need the effort to get the knowledge. But if you haven't got the knowledge, you can't... You know, I'm, my business won't be successful, but if I haven't got any knowledge, if I'm just a guy that says, oh, come on, try harder, 
they're going to be like, well, I'm, I'm trying hard and I'm still not getting better. So, yeah, yeah subject yeah. knowledge. You know, like you're, you've been in media all your life. Yeah. There'll be some people that are, that are really top-end media and some are in media that haven't got the skills, but they've lagged it. Yeah, fair point. Hey, Steve, um, you've combined your two life passions in the title of, as we can see behind you, your coaching manual, Educating Football. Um, and really leading on from what we've been discussing, should I sense from the title that you actually believe that sporting activity in general is a real contributor to how we develop life skills? Um, yeah, communication, friendships, all of these things. Um, it's really interesting. I'm not involved in any teams at the moment. I'm, I'm probably more lonely now, Bernard, than I've ever been. I've got no colleagues. I've got no non-league. I've got no, you know, no, uh, I mean, my, my golf is probably my, my way I get relationships. So yeah, sport and activity is, is proven to improve mental health, not only from a personal and a neurobiological level, but also from a level where we're interacting with people and, and it's, you know, socially making us feel better loved and cared for. So I think everyone um, wants to feel important. I don't know anyone in the world that doesn't want to feel important. So if you're a kid in a football team, you want to feel important. If you're a CEO, you want to feel important. And what sport does is give us that, that sense of, of feeling important by others. Right. Actually, in terms of uh, feeling important and the link to sport, that's actually quite relevant because, of course, especially among the younger generation these days, active sporting participation is under threat. Esports are now the substitute for physical yeah. active real sport and i know we're promoting accessibility more widely uh but nonetheless i mean do you really think at the moment politicians associations sporting umbrella bodies are really doing enough to to actually lure this generation away from their screens oh it's just, that's a difficult one because the adults are on their screens aren't they so people see people do bernard you know, look, people see, people do. Is my phone right here? So I, I think that's a challenge. I think, again, it's about education and a modernised, sensible approach to human development. Like When I mean modernised, we've now got phones. Everyone's got a phone. So we can't put the phone away and say, don't use it. We've got to adapt to it. You know, Gareth Southgate at the World Cup said to his players, you can have your phones. He didn't put a ban on them. Because if you put a ban on something, people are going to do it anyway, aren't they? So I think, again, it's, it's, it's a fine lines with, with the sports on eSports because I played a lot of computer games as a kid and I still like computer games now to an extent, but I know when to stop. The problem with things like this, they can become quite addictive. And, you know, I was also fortunate, remember, that I played sport as well. But there'll be a lot of gamers, you know, gamers as they're called, that won't do the exercise and mm. won't have the family unit for dad or mum to take them out and go for a bike ride or... I'll do that to us. So I think, listen, I haven't got the answers for you, really. I think, I think the government are miles off it half the time anyway, Bernard. I can't lie. You know, I, I can't. No, I say this, Bernard. When are we going to get a politician where, where they, you know, the type of guy that I want, or woman that I'd go for a pint with? Like, they're so far away from me as a human being. Like, they haven't got a clue what goes on in failing in the London schools. They don't know that there's still gang culture going on. They don't know why the kids are joining the gangs. And then they're telling us how to run schools. So, I mean, I'm not involved in schools anymore. But, yeah, the, the government worry me a lot because I'm just waiting for us to start getting some really down-to-earth politicians. And I know there are, because I don't want to label every politician as, as not down-to-earth, but some of them are miles away from the everyday person, Bernard. Right. Um, but maybe, is, is there anything you think that could possibly change in terms of outreach, if you want to call it that, from perhaps... Um, the sports clubs themselves, specifically maybe, you know, the ones at a, at a grassroots level to actually try and encourage more involvement? It won't, yeah, I don't want to put a downer on this. It won't just be the clubs. It'll be, you know, I call it triangulation. It'll be the parent, the player, the kid and, and the club. It'll be the parent, the kid and the school. So we need all three to be aligned. So we, in, in behaviour conditioning, we call it triangulation. If you don't get all three connecting, it won't work. Right. So, so again, you know, it's not it's it's social science, really, Bernard. It's not it's not an easy answer, but you you know you have to have alignment and frequency, you know, between everybody. So the club, the parents, and, and going back to the Met Police ambassador role, really, one of my my bits of advice to Lisa all the time was get alignment. 
between the players, the parents, and the club of what the club wants. Right. What are we, so key performance indicators, basically. What is the club actually trying to do? Are, you know, instead of going from season to season to season, just all willy-nilly, what are you trying to achieve at the end of the journey at Met Police? So let me give you an example. Let me apply this for you. The key performance indicators for an under 10s team are number one, enjoyment. Number two, equal participation. So every kid gets equal minutes. And number three, and by the way, I'm making this up. Number three, <laughs> yeah, no, try and win. Try and win. Because we want to try and win. Yeah. So a parent comes in and says, oh, my son should be playing more minutes. Because I've already got it in writing. Now, hold on. You've signed this parent, triangulation club kid parent. Yeah. Every kid's getting the same minutes. Then there's no grey areas, is there? No. Oh, it's the easiest thing. To, I know it's make it sound easy, but it is that easy. So the parents just shut up. You can't, you can't say anything about anything. Now, if the KPIs at some club are, we want the best kids to play, that's also fine. But then the kid with a less talented, a parent with a less talented child, then knows that that's what's going to happen. And that parent has a choice to keep them at the club or send them somewhere else for other, other experiences. So this is the biggest gap in new football. The biggest gap is different lenses on the world and different alignment between parents and coaches. And then we just, it just causes havoc. Right. And we can sort that out on a bit of A4 paper. Hey, one final question, actually, Steve. Also, um, you have a, a unique bridge in that you work with both the business and the sporting communities. I mean, an obvious question, really. In performance management, in coaching, in terms of being in the right place in your mind, can sport learn from business? And can business learn from sport? Yeah, sport's miles behind in many aspects. So, I mean, I, I don't want to batter sport across the board, but football, which is, which is my sport. Let me tell you this story, Bernard. Um, Clive Woodford, when he won the World Cup, went into Southampton. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. And everyone laughed him out of the building. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, all right. What, what are you doing here? You're a rugby coach. What do you know about football? Yeah. Now he speaks at all the football conferences, Bernard, 10 years later. So he's exactly the same guy, but the football industry couldn't handle it because the football industry is full of a lot of stupid people, isn't it? So that, that's the problem. So the football industry needs to open up its eyes to all these different aspects of learning so the, the football industry is definitely getting better. We now have key performance indicators in football clubs. We now have objectives. We now have data. And we now use data to inform learning and players and staff, which is great. What can business learn from sport? Business can learn about we, not me. Business can learn about group dynamics. Business can learn about um, selfless behaviours and how teams become great. Uh, businesses can learn about the difference between teams and groups and what defines the difference is. Um, businesses can learn really about about sort of the top one percent and what that what that means. You know what is one what is the top one percent behaviour? What you know? So yeah, I think listen, we all know Bernard that they're blended. There's there's the they, you know a football is a business. You know, but what I'm trying to do for my job is, you know, particularly for the Met again, going back to that, is create a process where there's greater alignment. Yeah, and that that reduces conflict, Bernard. And then that enhances mental health. And then that leads to less stress and more happiness. Right. I mean, Steve, one final point. You just mentioned about alignment. I mean, do you believe that the ideal approach to a, a club of, like the Met and maybe some other non-league clubs that have a, a path from junior level up to non-league level, that the, the, the best thing to do is have a kind of a, a footballing philosophy, if you like, almost, that sort of manages everything that runs through the club? Or is it just more a question of whatever fits each yeah, particular difficult. level, do you think? No, yeah, it's so difficult. Let me explain why. If you did remember in a school, as a school, you all got a pro form as to how to teach, but the weak teachers still let you down, Bernard. So that's even in a school level. Weak teachers just let down the system. Right. And, right. It, it, so it's more of the monitoring of the operational aspects. I know that probably sounds too complicated. So what goes on on the grass, yeah, it's not necessarily what goes on the grass, it's the monitoring of it and who does it. 
and how accurate are they? It's called standardization in schools. Mm. It's how do our kids compare to the kids down the road? How do these kids compare to the, the other school down the road? It's like a, like um, benchmarking almost. Yes. So that, that's almost impossible. So what I will say again is, is standard KPIs from the top of the club. And my biggest bit of advice to them is, number one, have fun. And number two, can we make our players better? Technically, tactically, physically, and the most important one in the joint is psychologically. Can we make our players better from when they join the Met Police to whenever they leave? And if they leave, will they come back to the club in 20 years' time and then regurgitate their children doing the same things? That's, that's the legacy that the club really want, don't they? Building a real community aspect. Steve, thank you so, so much for making all the time this morning uh, for your honest, candid answers. Um, it just remains for me to wish you every success in your new role with the Met uh, and uh, that hopefully I'm not going to impinge on your, uh, your next broadcast session in a few hours' time. Uh, hi, mate. I've got to get the train into London. A bit nervous about that. Yeah, all right. Fair yeah. enough. Thank, Steve, thank you so Good much job. once again. Thanks. Cheers, mate. Nice one. All right.